determined to show that with improvements in their technology, Three Mile Island would never happen again. So far, breeder reactors had done badly. A demonstration plant near Detroit had a partial meltdown. A proposal to construct a breeder at Clinch River, Tennessee, became prohibitively expensive and was canceled. But Argonne insisted their breeder was different, and they were going to put it to the test. There was no uh, certainty at the time we started the IFR that the kinds of uh, uh, characteristics that would enable the reactor to shut down itself, shut itself down safely, would in fact work at full power. So in April 1986, the scientists at Argonne conducted an experiment on the integral fast reactor to determine the safety of the design. If we pick out the worst case transient and conduct it on EBR2 and show that with no operator action or no automatic action, the plant simply shuts itself down by itself, passively, that we're inherently safe. Three weeks later, Outside the city of Kiev in the Soviet Union, an experiment was conducted on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. T minus one minute. In Idaho, with the reactor at full power, the operators deliberately shut off the flow of coolant to the core. the temperature rose. At Chernobyl, the coolant flow was also cut off. The temperature rose. In Idaho, the scientists stood back and watched. But as scientists at Chernobyl watched, they realized they were losing control of the reactor. They tried to shut it down, but it was too late. With the loss of coolant flow, the chain reaction continued. The result was an explosion that blew up the reactor building and sent an enormous cloud of radioactivity into the air. The world watched in horror as the Soviets attempted to deal with the worst nuclear disaster in history. You place the primary pump controllers into the cascade mode. But no one even knew that out in the Idaho desert, the experiment ended very differently. Now we're all uh, ready, all assembled. Just at that moment, unconnected almost to the whole experiment, uh, one of the safety valves on the turbine, uh, on the steam line, let go. And when they go, they go with a tremendous bang. Now picture this, we had 70 or, uh, 60 or 70 people, they're looking at this temperature trace going straight up like that, and there's suddenly a great bang right beside them. I happen to be standing at the back of the room, and these heads just went straight up like so, and then turned right around to see whether the Argonne people were running. Within a uh, few seconds, the temperature trace turned around and went right down, and the reactor uh, survived the event uh, without any uh, problem at all. In the IFR, the metal fuel expanded. The atoms in the fuel moved apart, unable to fission. The chain reaction stopped, and the reactor shut itself down. Till's team believed they had discovered the secret of how to make a nuclear reactor inherently safe that relied on the laws of nature, not operator intervention for its safety. But that discovery was lost to the world in the terrifying experience of Chernobyl. Here in West Berlin tonight, a party, much of the party on the Berlin Wall. Thousands of young Berliners have gathered on the wall dancing and celebrating what they believe to be its imminent demise. In 1989, the journey of Atoms for Peace took another dramatic turn when the collapse of the Soviet Union began and the Cold War ended. Word was sent to Hanford to stop production of nuclear weapons and the reactors were shut down immediately. The war effort was over. The cleanup began.
The biggest problem for Hanford sat dangerously close to the Columbia River. Forty-year-old basins that hold 2,100 metric tons of deteriorating, irradiated fuel in corroding canisters. The water in which they sit is highly contaminated. Already gallons of radioactive water have leaked into the ground. It's one of the deadly legacies of atoms for war. But ironically, the atoms for peace scientists see Hanford as an opportunity to apply what they've been discovering over the last 50 years. David Blanchard from Battelle Labs is extracting the same radioactive isotope that was first explored at the Argonne Hospital 40 years ago, called strontium. As it decays, another isotope called yttrium is formed. And when you choose yttrium because you're able to extract it in, in small uh, enough form. It has, it's got several important qualities. It has a very short half-life. And so when they, they give this to the patients, it does the work and then it's gone. It is truly turning swords into plowshares, the essence of what Atoms for Peace was all about. From this lab just outside Hanford, Extractions of waste from weapons production as being processed, carefully measured, packed, and shipped to cancer hospitals around the country. One hospital is the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, where doctors are using the isotope to fight Hodgkin's disease in patients who have no other options. Dr. Hubert Vriesendorp is seeing a response in three out of four patients. If you come in at the far end, you have patients that are usually sick and uh, very resistant to treatment. It's very exciting to get a 75% response rate. That, that's really unheard of. has not been happening uh, with other kinds of new treatments. Bill Ford is an English teacher from Alabama participating in the FDA trials of the new treatment. He was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease 17 years ago. Oh, I think that the fact that uh, any positive uh, finds that we can make for the post-Cold War uh, use of these warheads that we're disassembling uh, has to be a, a real positive thing. Plus, glowing in the dark uh, when after you get your stuff is just really neat as well. It's been a dream since the early 50s to direct a selective radioactive blow to tumors. And today, a new way of delivering the material to the tumor alone has been devised. Before the yttrium is injected into the patients, it's combined with a man-made cancer-seeking protein called a polyclonal antibody. That turns the radioactive material into a smart bullet that will seek out the tumor and attach itself to it. The radiation will destroy the cancer without hurting the healthy tissue around it. And just think, we could have bombed Russia with this stuff. A few weeks after Bill Ford received his injections, the FDA and the MD Anderson Cancer Center temporarily closed the study for a procedural review. Still, other research is going forward to turn waste into medicine. But for those with the dream of bringing endless electrical power to the world, the story ends very differently. By the mid-1970s, the costs of constructing commercial nuclear power plants were skyrocketing. And the growth in the demand for electricity was dropping. Orders for commercial plants were canceled. Today, 100 nuclear power plants provide 20% of the electricity in the United States. But no new orders for plants have been placed since 1978. It got to be too expensive. One of the reasons it got to be too expensive is because regulations were piled on regulations after Three Mile Island with uh, what, what some of the people in the industry call the, the ratchet effect of cranking up regulation after regulation without removing the ones that were no longer valid. And that added to the expense. But it was primarily just an old-fashioned economic problem of a technology that was more expensive than another technology, fossil fuels, that led to the demise of nuclear power, not because the people were picketing outside the door. With conventional commercial nuclear power at a standstill and increasing environmental concerns about the burning of fossil fuels, the scientists at Argonne felt they were in a good position to offer a new approach. What they came up against was fear. The same fear that grew out of the scenes of the aftermath of the bombs in Japan. 
and continued for 45 years, fueled by an arms race that used atoms for war. Despite the scientists' effort to make their reactor proliferation-proof, many still believe that where there is plutonium, there will be nuclear weapons, that it is impossible to separate atoms for peace from atoms for war. A leading opponent of breeder reactors is Natural Resources Defense Council scientist Tom Cochran. Breeder reactors use large quantities of plutonium as a fuel. This plutonium is weapons usable. You could build this in the future, this technology in the Middle East, Argentina, Brazil, North Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Pakistan, India, so forth. And those countries legitimately could stockpile a huge arsenal of atomic weapons. The final blow for the IFR came in 1993, when the priority for government became reducing a huge federal deficit. For the first time since the nuclear age began, investment in the new technology was seen as too expensive for something that is not needed today. We're eliminating programs that are no longer needed, such as nuclear power research and development. We're slashing, we're slashing subsidies and canceling wasteful projects, but Many of these programs were justified in their time, and a lot of them were difficult for me to recommend reductions in. Uh, we got the final word the same time that the, that the uh, senators and House of Representatives got the word through C-SPAN. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were watching our fate as we watched the votes being counted. There, were, there was no joy in Mudville that day. Today, the experimental reactor program at Argonne that began nearly 50 years ago is over. The journey has ended. While experiments on the waste reprocessing program continue, the fuel assemblies are being pulled out of the reactor core. The medical applications of splitting the atom are the most promising now. But at Argonne, no one is willing to give up on the dream of unlimited energy for the entire world. Alan Shresheim is the current director of the laboratory. Other countries are developing nuclear power. They haven't said, well, the U.S. has stopped it. We're going to stop it. We are inevitably shifting what was a real technological lead overseas. And uh, we will wind up then sometime in the future when we need to have that option negotiating with some other country to bring it back. Well, how do you feel as a scientist who has spent 50 years developing an industry, finally to solve the two big problems and now nobody wants it? Well, I feel that the large-scale use of nuclear power is inevitable. I think any uh, calm, uh, objective look at the uh, numbers as to what to the magnitudes of energy that will be required in the next decades, uh, you, you're forced to the conclusion you must use large amounts of nuclear. I don't think that uh, this technology is uh, likely to be uh, dead forever, but I do regret that I may not be there to see it. From the beginning, the dream was to solve problems the world faces. And to the explorers who dreamt it, it seems more urgent than ever in the face of a warming climate and withering natural resources. Now, in the end, they feel the loss is not just a breeder reactor, but the commitment to keep searching for the answer.